talking about today and two middle grade novels like Nothing Amazing Ever Happened and Once You Know This. She has worked in the fields of health policy, community development, and victim advocacy and holds degrees from Auburn University and Keaton College. She lives in Mobile with her husband, Andrew, and four children who range in age from six to 14. I first met Emily when she was the director of the Gulf States Health Policy Center under the leadership of Dr. Regina Benjamin, the former Surgeon General of the United States. Emily met with the library director and myself to have a candid conversation about libraries and homelessness. I'm also the proud owner of her husband's fine work of art, a beautiful cutting board. Her husband, Andrew, owns a small business called Radio Woodworks and is often seen at local craft fairs. The quite talented family of writers, advocates, um, nature conservancy, and crafting. We thank Emily for being here today and sharing her talents and sharing her knowledge with us. So I don't wanna wait any further. Emily, uh, if you would like to share your screen and your presentation, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Um, my grandmother grew up in a tiny little Presbyterian church called Vernal Presbyterian in um, Vernal, Mississippi, outside Loosedale. And you know, if you're outside Loosedale, you're really out in the country. So always oh, nice to, to be back in the, the Presbyterian fold. So not um, to interrupt you as you're getting started, Emily, we actually have a church member who grew up in that Vernal Presbyterian Church as well. Y'all, that's where no Rudolph, way. Rudolph Hall is from that congregation. So Okay, I'll have to ask my family about that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Come on. Okay, can you all see my screen? Okay. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, I'm gonna to talk today about my book, The Story of Alabama and 14 Foods, and um, here's the cover. And I always like to start with a story. Um, so I came to Alabama in 2004, and shortly after that, I went to Auburn to get my master's degree in something called rural sociology, which most people have never heard of, but it is a field of study. And I kind of took it upon myself to be really a student of Alabama. I went to all kinds of meetings and festivals. I, I didn't know anything about Alabama. And so I just sort of dove right in. I read all the books I could find. I, you know, I didn't have kids yet, so I was free to just go explore and, and dig in. And I got really interested in civil rights history. And I was working in economic development, community development at the time and studying that field. And I became convinced that Alabama really needed something like a civil rights trail to allow people to come in and see these amazing sites that we have. Some of them are well marked, but some of them are not marked at all. Um, and they exist throughout the Black Belt, which is a region that can always use more tourism dollars. And I had this grand plan. And so I took it upon myself to go out and research civil rights history, write the guide, take the photographs, travel all over the state, and I wrote it all up in this package and presented it to the University of Alabama Press. And they said, um, we really like what you've done here, but we already have a book like this under contract and we, we can't use it. And so um, I like to tell that story because it's really a, a story of, of failure and I think when you look at uh, a book cover like this and sometimes it seems like the, the path to a project like this is is straight and you just walk right along it but not at all um, the only path I've ever traveled has been zigzag so at that moment I had you know a choice to make do I just sort of throw up my hands and say I did all this work for nothing or am I able to pivot and do something different. And fortunately, um, the editor at, at UA Press said, you know, but we really, you, you know, you're a strong writer and we really like this idea of the trail. Could you do a different kind of trail? Could you do like a gardening trail or a sports trail or could you do a food trail? And so when he said food trail, I thought, okay, 
I could, I could do that. And that was that moment where I sort of had to pivot. And um, I talk to students a lot, to schools, and I always say, you know, that to, to see these projects come to fruition, to see, you know, what you want to do come, come to reality does not mean that you're not going to hit roadblocks. That it's based on your ability to, to pivot and get around them or to start walking in a different direction. So that's what I had to do with this book. Um, and luckily, I was able to fold in a couple of those civil rights stories and history into this book. But that's where I started. I started with, could you do a food trail? And I had no idea what that would look like. Um, but I knew what I didn't want to do. I knew I didn't want to do just a straight up cookbook because I felt like that had been done so well already. Um, I didn't want to do a food travelogue, which is like where, you know, where you just ride around and eat things and write about it. Um, Cause that was also really big at the time. And I'm just always the most interested in history and culture. Um, I was telling Buzz, I was a religion and anthropology major and, undergrad and then of course sociology and so I really wanted to, to sort of dig into the foods themselves and how those foods represent the stories of Alabama. And I want to talk a little bit more about process later and how I chose the foods and everything but um, I'll just kind of get into the presentation and show you a little bit about how that worked in the book. And this was just something of like I mentioned, that was organic and I was just making it up as I went along. So um, I don't want you to think I just sat down with this beautiful plan. It just developed as it went. And for those of you who are creative or interested in being creative, that's how it works. <laughs> just one foot in front of the other and see what happens. Um, so the very first chapter of the book is corn. And that is because corn is the is the most important food in Southern history, bar none. Um, when corn appeared in the Mississippian era, which we sometimes call prehistory, it revolutionized Native American life in present day Alabama. Um, tribes turned from nomadic to agrarian societies, it reorganized everything. And of course, we have the second largest um, Mississippian Native American settlement here in Alabama at Moundville. And that was a huge, hugely important site. And then of course, when European settlers came along, um, corn, it was corn that spared them from starvation. It was the Native Americans that taught them how to plant and harvest and grow corn. And corn was on the table every meal. Um, the first thing you did as, as a pioneer was plant corn before you even sent, you know, for your wife and kids and worried about anything else. It was get the first crop of corn in the ground. It was survival food. Um, it was it was the most important food. Just to give you a, a number, so you, we always hear about cotton and how important cotton was, and cotton is king. Um, in 1849, the South, as a region, not just Alabama, had five million acres planted in cotton and 18 million acres planted in corn. So corn was the people's food. That's what most people were growing and living off of. Um, and of course. We have a, a lot of stories that tie to corn in Alabama. So the Battle of Horseshoe Bend took place on Alabama soil. It was that battle that distinguished Andrew Jackson um, as a military man and propelled him to win the presidency. And it was Andrew Jackson who really pushed Indian removal through Congress and removed all of those tribes from Alabama. And one thing I learned while researching this book that I thought was really interesting was the Indian removal, which happened in 1830. Um, yeah, 1830, um, was really hotly contested. It was not a, a slam dunk, everybody wants this to happen. It was actually the votes were really, really close. And so it, it was just um, Jackson's sort of unshakable will that pushed that through. But I think it's important to remember that sometimes when we look back at history and we think um, things look inevitable, and they're really not. That was, there were a lot of people who were against that period, that decision. So most Native Americans leave Alabama in the 1830s, um, but there are small groups that remain Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Creeks. And today we have the Porch Creeks who were sort of um, underground for about 100 years. It was, it was not wise to self-identify as Native American. There was a lot of discrimination. 
Um, so from the 1830s to about the 1930s, um, you really didn't say, you know, if, if, you were, if you were a Native American. But in the 40s and 50s, the Porch Creeks um, started really organizing and um, there was the American Indian Movement in the 70s, which helped. Um, they they um, consolidated some of their schools and so they had a lot of school pride and eventually became um, this sort of cultural force in Alabama that we see today. So this is a picture of the Porch Creek um, Indian powwow that occurs in Atmore every Thanksgiving day and the day after. Um, if you ever find yourself without Thanksgiving plans or without something to do on Friday, it's really an awesome event and, and so cool to see. These are the powwow dancers. They're ages eight to 18, I think. Um, and so these are actually the, the Porch Creek kids that perform. And there are a lot of other performers too. So, um, I'm just hitting on some very high, you know, 30,000 foot points here, but you can see that corn runs throughout our state's history and it just splinters off into all these different stories that you can tell. So that's kind of how, how the book goes. You know, we pick a food and then we tell a specific, I tell a specific Alabama story about it. So I'll give you another example, going backwards, gumbo. So this is a great um, example to share with you because it's a mobile story. Um, and I love gumbo because it's, it's such a great metaphor. All the ingredients are from all over the world. And the way that Southern food was made was by mixing all of these ingredients in all of these cultures. And that's what's so cool about Southern food. And the definition of Southern food really is that it's a mix of African, European, and Native American cultures, foods, techniques, and really strongly African techniques. I mean, African cooks were cooking in most, in many Southern kitchens, and they were the ones who fused sort of their, their knowledge from their African traditions and their, their foods with European knowledge, with Native American ingredients. Um, for instance, you know, in West Africa, they cooked with the yam. And so they just applied everything they knew about the yam to the sweet potato when they got here. And so you see a lot of African pairings and, and spices. And gumbo is perfect, um, a perfect example of that. You've got, you've got ingredients from all over the world. This hand belongs to a woman called Dora Finley. Some of you probably know her. She's passed now, um, but she uh, cooked gumbo as a family tradition on Mardi Gras. So that's another interesting part about gumbo is that it's really closely connected with the Creole and African-American Mardi Gras traditions. So when you go to a Creole house on Mardi Gras, they are always cooking the same four foods, and that's ham, potato salad, red beans and rice, and gumbo. Well, gumbo is the centerpiece of Mardi Gras. And so by looking at gumbo, you can kind of launch into not only the Mardi Gras history in Mobile, but also the Creole history. Um, Mobile, as you know, I don't have to tell you, um, is very different than the rest of the state historically. It's older, it's European, it's Catholic, and all those things, it has such a that strong European Catholic heritage that it gave way to this Creole culture that was very different than the Protestant, largely Baptist, white. We can hear you, Emily, but we can't. Uh, you're frozen. All right, so it might have removed Emily. So when I set out to write a book on Alabama food, I knew I had to include fried green tomatoes um, because they're so iconic and um, fried green tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe, the book and the movie are so awesome. And Fanny Flagg is, is just awesome, great writer. 
but I didn't know what I would say about it because to build a whole chapter, you have to have a lot of content. And so it's, you can't just say Fanny Flag is amazing in the end. You know, you have to have something original and interesting to say. Um, and so I kind of just bookmarked it and let it sit for a minute to see how that would flush out. And eventually um, I wrote about, I wrote a little bit about Slocum where they grow a lot of tomatoes and that's um, in the wiregrass, I, sort of a Jolson. Um, but also, thank you. So, but also really that chapter became about vegetables. And I think, um, you know, I grew up in Minnesota and with Southern, with a Southern dad and all four Southern grandparents. And so I was, I grew up in a really interesting hybrid of Southern heritage and living in the North. And so I'm always really aware of what people, the stereotypes that people have about the South. And one thing, you know, is around the food. People automatically think of fried chicken and barbecue and they should, those are awesome. And they're in the book too. But when you look back historically, the really the center of the southern diet for hundreds of years was vegetables most people lived on the farm you know like i mentioned before this um people who owned and operated plantations were in the in the very tiny minority most people in alabama were subsistence farmers and so with we're blessed with such a long growing season um that we grow all year long we grow all kinds of vegetables and that's mainly what we eat meat was expensive and so sometimes maybe you'd see a little bit of meat on the table um but not not usually and and cornbread but the biggest meal for the farm family of course was in the middle of the day um at noon and it was mostly vegetables all different kinds of vegetables and so southern cooks you know who are sort of started it or chefs who are part of this kind of new wave of southern cooking um will tell you that that getting vegetables that are fresh and seasonal and, and the way that you pair vegetables uh, together um, are really at the heart of the Southern food experience. Um, and then moving on, oh, actually going back, um, those kitchen issues come up one of the time. So that's the previous um, slide side. Um, the guys Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, hang on one second. I'm going to see if I can. Okay. Um, That's better. Better? Okay. I don't know why I'm having these problems today. Okay. So, if you haven't read a lot about George Washington Carver, um, I encourage you to dig a little deeper. He is an amazing person. He was selfless, just dedicated to his students. He was a pioneer of ideas around ecology. Um, really one of the first scientists to start talking about everything being interconnected and interrelated. He didn't waste anything. He was a recycler. He built his whole lab at Tuskegee out of you know, stuff he found in the junkyard, discarded equipment, and just and really a, a deeply religious person. Also, he loved plants, loved nature. When he was a little kid, people would bring sick plants to him and he would tell them what to do. And I mean, I could just go on and on about him. But of course he worked at Tuskegee. He was part of the extension system. And the most important thing to George Washington Carver was to take, and, the, and it's still the most important thing about extension today. The point of extension is to take what what we learn at these cutting edge universities, take that knowledge to the people who need it. And so in George Washington Carver's day, everything they were learning about planting and soil and farming techniques and crop rotation, um, that needed to get to the farmers in Macon County where he was at Tuskegee. And then of course throughout the state because they were really suffering. The soil was worn out, this is the 20s and 30s, um, worn out from cotton, it needed to be planted with plants like sweet potatoes and peanuts that give nitrogen back to the soil. So that's why he was so big on peanuts. 
not only does it rehab the soil, but it also gives you something really nutritious and filling a lot of protein to eat. Um, okay, and so um, his mission really was to bring that knowledge to everybody and he created something called a movable school. So instead of requiring all of these um, farmers to come to Tuskegee University to learn, he took his methods to them and he had this horse and covered wagon with all of his equipment and supplies and went out into um, Macon County and the Blackout County. And a lot of times farmers um, couldn't make the changes that he was suggesting because sharecropping and tenant farming was rampant. A lot of the farmers who were working the land didn't make the decisions. Um, some of the farmers who own those those properties, and it's still true today, don't even live in the state. Um, and so there was a lot of good knowledge and good technique, but there was really a disconnect between what he was trying to do, what Extension was trying to do, and what could happen on the ground. With one exception, um, in the Wiregrass region, the boll weevil came through in 1916 um, and just destroyed 60% of the crop. Um, and so those farmers were ready to do something different because they had to, they were forced into it. And the soil in the wiregrass has always been, it's not like flat belt soil, it's sandy and it's hard to grow stuff anyway and it's a little fussy. Um, and so they were willing to give it a shot and they planted peanuts um, and they were rewarded with a bumper crop. In 1917, they produced a million bushels of peanuts, which was the largest harvest in the nation that year. And so that's why we see, so in, in thanks to um, the boll weevil for forcing them to change their method in the center of Enterprise, Alabama, you see the boll weevil statue. Um, and that stands for crop diversification. Um, and the other, the other interesting story that peanuts tell um, is the story of black land ownership. So they're, even though they face so many barriers, um, racial discrimination, not being able to buy land, exorbitant interest rates. Um, African Americans managed to own a lot of land in the South. Um, that peaked in 1910, they owned 15 million acres um, in the region. And right after that begins this great migration of African Americans to the North and also um, in general farmers start to leave the land, and that's for a lot of different reasons. Um, and so by the time I met Al, which is on the previous slide, um, Sarah, if you can go back, um, it was 2010. So I met Al, there he is with his boiled peanut, a um, hundred years after black landowning peaked in the South. And by the time I met him, he was in Macon County, the same county where George Washington Carver worked and, and did all of his extension work. Um, Mr. Hooks was the only full-time African-American farmer in the county. All the other full-time farmers were white and all the other African-American farmers farmed part-time. And so it was just this amazing sort of last man standing moment where you can see how much changes in the course of a hundred years, especially in the 20th century. Um, and he's, he was not always a farmer, although it was in his family and was sort of struggling um, to make it work and, and traveling all around central Alabama to get to farmers markets. And, you know, as federal farm policy that was actually well, really well intended um, during the New Deal had some tough ramifications for small farmers as those decades went forward. So um, that's another example of a lot of different stories that one little peanut can tell about our history in Alabama. Okay, now the next slide. Um, so those are some of the some of the well-known ones that you would all think of: um, fried green tomatoes and gumbo and corn. But I was also interested in finding some lesser-known stories. And you can advance to the next slide if you would, Sarah. Um, so the first one is one that you probably know a little bit about, which is uh, the banana docks in Mobile. So banana pudding is one of the chapters, and that tells the story of the banana docks. And actually, interestingly, you know, the, the banana docks were 
well, let me back up. So in 1890, Mobile's economy is in shambles. Um, cotton is worth half of what it was um, before the Civil War. And the city is really sort of languishing economically, and it's getting a reputation for just being kind of a, a gritty place to be. And so the city leaders were interested in cleaning it up, pushing it forward into the new century. You know, what can we do? Um, they had all this infrastructure along the harbor. And so they thought, well, what if we switch to um, exports? I mean, imports instead of exports. You know, we have all this stuff. What if, what if we try to do imports? And so the Chamber of Commerce um, in 1893, yeah, I see that about the slide. We have to, um, needs to go to the next one, but that's okay. Um, the Chamber of Commerce in 1893 offered an incentive of $1,500 to the first company that would bring regular fruit imports to the port of Mobile. And that happened um, the same year. It was on the ship Sala. They brought bananas from Central and South America. So um over the next decades bananas were basically the linchpin of mobile's economy bananas revitalized you know the whole thing they at the time they were um you know the last few years of the of the 1800s bananas were still kind of a luxury they weren't known that well they were considered um a symbol of the tropics and they were expensive they were really just coming on the scene and so it was it was a question of really good timing also um and so bananas were coming into mobile they sort of rebooted mobile's economy um by 1900 which is only seven years after they first arrived mobile was the third largest banana importer in the nation behind new york and new orleans and continued and bananas continued to be important to mobile's economy um, all the way until World War II, when we switched to a lot of shipbuilding and, and wartime commodities. And even though that's the case, we don't really hear about um, we don't really hear about bananas or the banana docks. A lot of times, you know, I'll ask for a show of hands how many people have ever heard of the banana docks in Mobile. And even if, among Mobilians, it's better that even among Mobilians, it's kind of a lost story. There's no signage that I know of. We have a lot of great photos in the archives at Cal, um, but just not something that we know too much about. Um, I'm going to take a second and see if I can fix these slides for y'all. So. Let me just see here if I can get back in. Okay. okay. Let me see if I can, if I can stop share Sarah's screen share. Yeah, I think I got it. Does everyone see the, t the book now, the title? Hold on just a sec. There we go. That should be it. Okay. Yeah. I want you guys to see this as I talk. Okay. So you see the banana docks now, the guys loading bananas. Okay. All right. So we're back. So the second, um, the second story I wanted to tell was of Viola Battery. Um, and just because it's, well, um, you know, Viola Battery has a special place in my heart because I worked there for five years with um, Dr. Benjamin and Sarah mentioned. Um, but well, what's interesting, I think, and, and like I said before, I'm always really aware of this sort of broad brush that, that, Alab that people paint um, Alabama with and always looking for opportunities to, to permeate that and to just give people just different examples of what Alabama is all about. So if you told most people that Alabama has a significant Southeast Asian population on the coast comprised of Vietnamese, Laotian and Cambodian immigrants, 
that's not something that most people know. And yet in Battery, this tiny little shrimping town, a third of the population um, are Southeast Asians. And there are three Buddhist temples and Asian grocery stores. And, um, you know, even people in Mobile feel like I think that Battery is really far away when I used to work there. They used to, people used to say, how long does it take you to get there? And I'd be like, it's 30 minutes. <laughs> Um, but it's sort of this really special, unique place, a combination of seafood harvesting and processing and shipbuilding um, and that, we, that we don't know enough about. We don't give it enough credit, I think, for um, just how interesting and different it is. And so the other reason I wanted to tell the story of Isla Battery is because um, it was so devastated during Hurricane Katrina and again with the oil spill. And we're still feeling those ramifications. And I think a lot of times when we hear about Katrina on a national scale, we hear about New Orleans and, and that's justified. Um, but the Alabama coast and the Mississippi coast were, were really hit hard um, and are experienced lasting effects from Katrina and the oil spill. And so I wanted to tell that story. And this is the last chapter in the book. So it kind of closes it out. Um, another interesting story that I came across um, were these barbecue clubs way out in Sumter County, which is in the Black Belt um, all the way to the Mississippi line and is the only county that we know of that has barbecue clubs in Alabama. So even though their settlement patterns look a lot like the counties around them, a lot of people coming in from North Carolina, um, Scots Irish, um, settled around the same time. It doesn't look that different from the counties that surround them, but yet they have these barbecue clubs that are unique to this one county. And it's really a rural tradition to give you a sense of it. Um, I was reading an interview with a guy who said who had started the newest of the barbecue clubs. And these are just clubs that get together once a month and, and have a barbecue. Um, and he said, well, he had to form his own club because he got tired of traveling to the other club that was closest to him. And when asked how far that was, he said six miles. So that gives you a sense of, you know, Livingston is the, big, the biggest city in Sumter County. That's where University of West Alabama is located, but they don't have a barbecue club. So this is really tiny communities. And I think it probably sprung up as a way just to get together. Um, especially after the sort of the rainy season um, where the roads are really muddy and impassable for months at a time. And so this is um, the Epps Barbecue Club and they just get together one, once a month. Um, the men, they used to of course roast their own hog, but now they, they get together the day beforehand and pull the pork and they all have their own special traditions. They all have their own sauce. Some of the Sauce recipes are a secret, but Epps was kind and shared theirs with me, and they all insist that their sauce is the best sauce. And of course, we know barbecue um, is a hotly contested uh, topic in the South and in Alabama. We have at least five or six regional variations of barbecue sauce in Alabama. Um, and so that, that's kind of a fun uh, topic to jump into. Um, another... Another story that I stumbled upon is, is actually another extension story. Um, when I worked for Auburn, I worked for extension, so I'm just a huge extension fan. Um, and these were called Girls Tomato Clubs. So this was another one of extension's methods to try to get people to plant other stuff besides cotton, and they weren't getting through to the adults. So they thought, well, maybe we'll teach the kids and they can influence their parents. And so, of course, they started with boys' corn clubs. Um, but then somebody said along the way, you know, what about girls, the other half of the population? And they formed these girls' tomato clubs, and they were really huge all across the South. They started in South Carolina, um, but they existed in Alabama, and this picture is taken in Alabama. Um, in the 1910s, and eventually 32,000 girls were members. And they basically were taught... Um, not only to grow the tomatoes, but how to um, grow different varieties, how to deal with the soil, how to can their products, how to market their products, how to write a business plan, how to do their budget. And so I love this story because it, it seems to me that d during this time period, 1910 to 1920, there probably weren't a lot of opportunities for young girls to learn business skills. 
um, especially in rural communities. And so I, I just love that that existed and, and then that happened. Um, so those are some of the stories that we don't hear so often. Um, another thing I wanted to do was tell stories with some national resonance. So stories that connect Alabama to the broader um, national story. And this is one, these are some suffragettes in Birmingham um, wearing their Votes for Women banners. And so this is really applicable um, for today because we're about to celebrate, I think on Tuesday, 100 years of, of women voting in the United States. So, um, but this story was one of my, it was one of my favorite chapters to write because it was such a windy road. So the other thing that I knew besides fried green tomatoes and others, barbecue fried chicken, um, that I knew I needed to include in a book on Alabama foods was the lane cake. Um, the lane cake has a little bit of a generational divide, um, but old, you know, seniors among us remember their grandmothers, their mothers making lane cake. It was especially made around the holidays. Um, and so I knew I had to include it in the book. And it's also became our state cake in 2016. I don't know if you all knew that we have a state cake, but we do. And it's the lane cake. Um, it was invented in, or pub, it was published in a, a cookbook called Some Good Things to Eat, which is just an awesome name for a cookbook. It's so humble. Um, in 1898 by Emma Rylander Lane. She was a resident of Clayton, Alabama. And that's where I started. And I dug into Emma Rylander Lane. I looked at Clayton. I tried to find the hook um, to come up with a whole chapter about lane cake, and I was really struggling. So that's another one that I just kind of put on the back burner for a while and came back to. And when I came back to it, I said, okay, maybe I'm just asking the wrong question. Maybe this isn't about Emma Rylander Lane per se or about Clayton, but, but what is it that made her self-publish this cookbook in 1898? Like what was going on that she felt like she wanted to take her time and her resources, her money and self-publish a cookbook? And that was really the question that turned the whole chapter for me, because it turns out that at that time in America, um, we were undergoing kind of a cookbook revolution. Women in America were writing cookbooks like crazy. And they were writing cookbooks in response to French cookbooks, which they felt like were esoteric and hard to follow and expensive and cumbersome and um, vague. And so when American women started writing cookbooks, they were doing it really for the sole purpose of helping each other run healthy and economical households. They wanted to create cookbooks that were for everyone, all classes, um, and they created very comprehensive cookbooks, thousands of recipes, and they didn't stop there. They had um, child rearing advice, how to set the table, etiquette, kitchen gardens. They were big on recycling. Um, and so they were really trying to create these books that would help other women who were mostly at home at this time, um, right around the turn of the century, um, you know, run healthy households. And they were proud of sort of their contribution to society, making healthy families, basically. So um, it's also a really interesting period of time for women. So in 1900, um, women are having half the amount of kids that they had in 1800. So they're having an average of four kids instead of eight, which as a mother of four, I still feel like is a lot of kids. But apparently they felt like, you know, now I have all this time on my hands. And they, there were also technological advances that were lightening their duties at home, like canned food and electricity and um, all kinds of time-saving devices. And so um, instead of just you know, sitting around appreciating um, their lives that had gotten slightly easier, they went out and decided they were going to join clubs and, and form clubs. And it became a movement kind of on the heels of this cookbook writing called the Alabama Club Movement. And African American women had their own clubs, white women had their clubs. They started as literary clubs, but then they became these clubs where they were really working on societal issues. They wanted to help society and they we're working on a lot of the issues that we still work on today, education, prison reform, poverty. Um, they were out there trying to make Alabama a better place. And um, Alabama women didn't want to be considered 
part of this sort of progressive era, progressive movement. They didn't want to be considered new women. They were doing all of their work in the name of home and family. And so when the first wave of um, suffrage kind of came through Alabama, the, the early leaders, it flopped because they were sort of asking women to step outside of their traditional gender roles. And women at this time in Alabama didn't want to do that. They were proud of their work in the home. That's where they got their identity and their power. And it, it just didn't resonate with them. And so later um, in 1918, 1919, um, the new leaders were able to convince women to advocate for the right to vote in the name of home and family. You know, they said, if you have the vote, you'll be able to vote on issues that will affect your families and your communities. And that was sort of the, the switch of the message that really resonated in Alabama women supported suffrage, um, like in droves. And when, let's see if I have that. Um, I have that stat here. Um, when, when the election came in 1920, I think Alabama women in that period, even though they had just gotten the right to vote in August, by November, they made up a third of the state vote in Alabama. So they mobilized very quickly. And that's partly because they had been um, writing cookbooks, forming clubs, and they had all of the connections and the writing experience, the speaking experience, um, the confidence that, that had been building all along the way. So I like that story just because it's, you think about a cake and you know, you don't know that it can kind of send you in this huge, different, interesting direction. And of course that, that's a national story. Another national story, um, this is a Montgomery story. This is Martha Hawkins. She runs an amazing restaurant in Montgomery called Hawkins, um, Hawkins Place and Martha's Place, sorry. And she, it's a soul food restaurant. And um, <clears throat> that's a really interesting Alabama story, too, because during, so she based her restaurant on a woman called Georgia Gilmore. Georgia Gilmore was an African-American mother of four during the bus boycott. And she, um, she testified on behalf of the boycott leaders, and she lost her job for it. And she started a restaurant in her home. It wasn't really called a restaurant. It was just, she lived in the, in the black neighborhood in Centennial Hill in Montgomery. And so people would come by there to eat. It wasn't a formal restaurant. Um, but she uh, hosted a lot of civil rights leaders and her home was a place where they could convene and talk about next steps, talk about what was going on, eat food that was nourishing and comforting and reminded them of you know, being home and their own childhoods and their own mothers and grandmothers cooking. Um, and so it was that blend of, sort of talking about these things that were happening, um, and eating this nourishing food that kind of it gives soul food its definition. And even though soul food and soul movement originated in New York, um, it's, these, it's this period where we think about um, these leaders coming together over these plates of traditional food that really gives soul food its identity in Alabama. And so when Martha Hawkins started her restaurant, she modeled it after Georgia Gilmore's restaurant. And there were restaurants like that um, in Birmingham, in Atlanta, in Memphis, it was kind of this um, this pattern where you know civil rights leaders would have this place to go to have these big discussions and eat the food that was familiar to them. And so, if you ever find yourself um, in Montgomery, definitely stop by Martha's place. The other thing about sweet potatoes too. The reason I I chose sweet potato pie. Oh, sorry, I left out the whole so many directions in, in these chapters that sometimes I get thrown off. But Georgia Gilmore, when she was, she, she ran a restaurant in her home, but after she was fired from her job, she also started something called the Club from Nowhere. And she named it that so that um, white people wouldn't discover what it was about and shut it down. But she sold cakes and pies all over Montgomery and she donated the proceeds back to the, to the MIA, to the movement. Um, and she often had the largest donation every week. So at their mass meetings on Monday night, she would stand up and give sometimes $200. This is, you know, 1955. And, and she would get a standing ovation. And so that was her contribution to the movement. And so that's why I chose sweet potato pie. And the other reason is because sweet potatoes, um, I mentioned that, you know, African-Americans were familiar with them from yams in West Africa. They were also a survival food, um, much like corn. They're easy to grow. 
Um, they don't need really good soil. You can put them in a pile of leaves over during the winter and they'll keep. Um, and they spared people of all classes and races from starvation during several different difficult periods in Alabama history. And so sweet potato is really one of those foods of survival. And I think that's why it became one of the icons of the civil rights movement. Um, and the last one that has sort of a, a national story um, is the story of Birmingham. Birmingham's a relatively new city. Um, and during the Great Depression, it got hit really hard. It was one of the hardest hit cities in the nation. Um, and that's because it was so heavily based on industry. There just weren't any other jobs that were outside of industry. And so um, this chapter is about sweet tea and I tell the story of Milo's tea. And it's really interesting because Milo and his family's um, story kind of runs alongside the story of Birmingham. It hit sort of the, the lowest lows in the Great Depression and then the highest highs during World War II when it rebounded and became um, the arsenal of the South, it was called. It was actually at one point um, the second American target after Pittsburgh because there was just so much um, war industry in Birmingham. And so um, that's a, that's kind of, that has a national resonance too. And I tell that story of Milo's family and of Birmingham as they go through those those eras. So I told you I was going to return um, to, and I'm mindful of our time, so I'll wrap up in just a few minutes. But I wanted to return to process for a minute because I usually get asked a lot of questions about how do you, how did you decide on 14 foods, which, and why 14? There's no reason that it was 14. But basically, what I did was um, had a huge list of foods, and I researched a lot of them. And I kept the ones that I felt like had a really strong Alabama story to tell. There are a lot of Southern foods that are common to a lot of states. There's a lot of stuff that's, that I unfortunately had to leave out because I couldn't write, you know, a book that was a thousand pages. But um, I tried to find those stories that really represented um, Alabama history. I tried to be diverse in terms of geography, um, of the, so I have Gulf Coast, North Alabama, Appalachia, Tennessee Valley. Um, you know, there's a Black Belt story, there's a Montgomery story. So throughout the South, Wiregrass. Um, I try to also be d diverse in terms of the foods themselves. And so we have some meat, some desserts, some vegetables. Um, we have gumbo, we have chicken stew, um, which is a Tennessee Valley tradition. So um, every time I'm in North Alabama, I say, how many, how many people know anything about gumbo? And they just look at me with these blank stares. And when I'm in Mobile, I say, how many people have ever heard of chicken stew? And it's, <laughs> it's the same thing. Um, so that just kind of goes to show you how local some of these traditions can be, just like those barbecue clubs that are just in one county. Um, and then I laid them out uh, as much in time order as I could, although there's tons of overlap. Here, but I wanted to sort of move you as the reader through the very beginning um, of Alabama in, into modern day. So that's kind of how that worked. And I think um, the, other, the other thing I'll say about the writing process, um, I got one really good piece of advice. Well, two really good pieces of advice. One was from um, an er, an, a reader of an early draft. So like I said, this was a, a windy organic process. And um, in my first draft, I had the history of the food like from the beginning. So I had the prehistory of all the foods. And one of my reviewers said, you know, I think um, all this is very interesting. Um, this is a book on Alabama food. So maybe you should just start the story like when the food gets to Alabama, which made all the difference and everybody who has looked at this book is grateful for that person's feedback because it actually is readable now um, that we don't ha that we don't have to say that potatoes were discovered in the Incans and the mountains of Peru and all that so that was the first really um, important piece of advice I got and the second was from my editor who said you know because um, we wanted this to be an accessible book I didn't want it to be I wanted it to of course um, be sound academic research, but I didn't want it to be dry. And so I had a lot of these sort of journalistic elements is what my editor called them where I'm out 
cooking or I went turkey hunting twice um, and absolutely loved it, which shocked me, um, but I had a great time. And so in every chapter, there's, there's some in-person thing that's happening. And that was um, most, of, most of the chapters I had that already, but there was some where I went back and, and cooked with somebody or did something in person. And that's really on purpose to try to make the, the reading interesting and accessible. Um, and so that it's not, it's not dry, it's easy to picture. Um, this is, these are jars of chicken stew. So there's a very specific chicken stew tradition that exists in North Alabama in a few counties and right over the border in Southern Tennessee. Um, again, kind of like the barbecue clubs, not sure why it's just, it's so localized, but it's such a big deal in those counties. There's chicken stew, there's a chicken stew, um, you know, at least one every weekend during the winter time. They'll make or they'll make it for organizational fundraisers or church fundraisers or like I when I made it I um, made it with the volunteer fire department in East Limestone in Limestone County and they'll cook 80 gallons at a time and then they sell it in these glass gallon jars and you have to bring your own jar um, and you line up and they fill them up and it's all when I mean, you start cooking at four in the morning people started lining up um, for us at 10 a.m. and I think it was sold out by noon. And so you freeze it and it's this very specific recipe, tomato base. They use potatoes as a thickener. Um, there's corn in there and it's, it's North Alabama, Tennessee Valley chicken stew and it's, it's their tradition. Um, and the other um, really localized tradition um, that I did was decoration day in Appalachia. Um, that's a very App Appalachian tradition. Every church or cemetery has their specific day and everybody gets together and um, cleans the graves. Sometimes they'll do that the day before, back in the day, you know, it was a two day thing. Cleans the graves, um, lays down flowers and sits around sharing memories. And it's kind of like a family reunion. It's a really big deal for them. Um, like little girls used to get a new dress for decoration day in, instead of Easter. So that kind of gives you a, and you would come, I met a man who would take leave from the military for decoration day instead of Christmas. You know, it was a really, really big holiday for them. All the family was expected to come home and sort of honor the dead and tell the stories. And when I went, you know, people would pass around genealogy lists and look at all the old photographs. And so it's kind of a neat tradition that's, that's really localized. This is Sand Mountain, but really localized in the Northeast part of our state. Um, and the last thing that I, that I want to say, that I always say in this presentation, is that I was, it, I was surprised and just heartened and happy over and over again by just the amount of diversity that exists in Alabama. Like I said, I think we get painted with a broad brush and pigeonholed a little bit, um, even, even within our state, even ourselves. And what I found most of all was that there are just so many stories to tell, so many different groups, so many different people, so many different traditions. Um, so if any of you, I always, I always do this at the end of this presentation, sort of a plea to, for help. Um, if any of you are interested in this kind of thing, I just encourage you to, to interview people while they're still here, um, to write a story, you know, even for the church or your local paper or just for yourself. And, and get these stories down. You know, I did a lot of this research about 10 years ago, and um, a significant amount of the people who I talked to are no longer with us. And so it just gives me a sense of the fleetingness of, of collecting this kind of information. Our world is changing so fast. It always has. Um, but if we don't get out there and kind of get this down, um, we'll lose it. And so just a personal example, that's my little guy, my oldest in that picture with the moon pie and he's 14. So, you know, it just goes so fast. Um, and the last thing I wanna say too, is that for those of you who are educators, um, a friend of mine, Foster Dixon, who is a talented writer and teacher, high school English teacher in Montgomery, wrote a curriculum guide um, to this book. It's a PDF and it's organized by chapter. And I just want to make sure you can see. Um, and so if any of you are interested in using that in your classroom, um, he did a fabulous job and it's available for free online at his website, fosterdixon.com. Um, so I'm going to end there. I think I'm right, oh, almost right on time.
And I, I apologize for the technical difficulties, um, but I just really enjoy being here with you today. Um, I'm a huge uh, passionate fan of Alabama in general, but especially all the history and culture that's here. And just my pleasure to share some of that with you today. So thank you for having me. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Emily, very much. We've had uh, a number of folks in the chat box that have been um, sharing their uh, uh, gratitude for what you've what you've put together and, and this sort of intersection of food and history. Um, so we, we, we don't have time for a lot of questions. Um, and thanks everybody for hanging in there through the, the, the tech stuff. But, um, you know, life happens. That's part of it. Um, I, so my, I had a question maybe to kick off though real quick, we have time for a couple. You mentioned, Emily, that there were some, um, that there were a few foods that you didn't have a chance to include. Um, and I'm just wondering what, you know, maybe a couple of those exciting ones that didn't make the, the book. Um, yeah, um, pecans. I really wanted to do pecans, but I already had peanuts. I really wanted to do oysters, but I already had shrimp and gumbo. Um, I wanted to do peaches and I probably should have, um, but I, I felt like peaches are so closely tied to Georgia. Same reason with catfish in Mississippi. So I was kind of conscious of that. And I also really wanted to do collards and I never, I could never find the hook. And then I just found out a few days ago that there's a community in Alabama that's like the official collar capital of the state. And I was really disappointed in myself. But then I realized that they didn't get that design. They didn't have their festival or whatever until recently. And so then I forgave myself. But um, I do talk about college a little bit in the vegetable chapter. But I could never find enough information to do a whole chapter on college. So there were, there were a lot that I wanted to include. Anybody else have a, a quick question? Uh, Emily, the, um, Martha's Place in Montgomery, where the civil rights leaders often convened, and you, you indicated that they did this in other places where there would be a kind of a soul kitchen for them. Were, did that precede, were those listed in like the green book? It was. Mm, I'm not, prob probably, I don't know because with Georgia Gilmore's restaurant, it was just kind of known in the community that you went down there for lunch and she never called it a restaurant, possibly on purpose. It might, you know, she might've had to bring it up to city code or something. And so I think some of these places were a little bit off the radar. So I, I actually don't know the answer to that question. That's really interesting though. Um, and I don't know enough about the, I guess the Green Book would have been in the 30s and 40s. Is that the time period? I don't know enough about when the time period was either. I, I can't recall the time period either, so it may have not overlapped. Yeah, it'd be interesting though to look, to look that up and see what's in there for Alabama. Emily, in the comments, uh, as you're describing some of these others, uh, one person said, uh, uh, Bonnie Irwin said, sounds like there may be a, a sequel in the making. Uh, so. Yeah. Spinning that into a question, what what do you think now that this this works behind you? What do you see as your next uh, next big project? On um, you know, I've been really fortunate and been able to write a couple pieces for Mobile Bay magazine recently. Um, both of them food related, and so I'd like to keep doing that. I won't do a sequel um, because the history of Alabama is still the same, and so I I told a lot of that sort of big history stuff in that book. And I think it'd be really hard to come up with a whole book with all different history. I guess it could be done, but I kind of feel like I've um, given that my best shot, but I'll hopefully still, still write some food pieces um, for the magazine and do that. Um, I would really like to write another nonfiction book in Alabama. And I'm always kind of listening for stories um, that haven't been told or haven't been told fully. And so I'd like to launch into kind of a totally new project, but still based on an Alabama history or an Alabama story. We've got a few folks asking in the chat about where you might recommend finding the book. <clears throat> you can find it if you want to buy it from an independent bookstore. You can find it at Bookshop 
bookstore.org. I think they carry it. Locally, um, the bookstore, uh, the Haunted Bookshop carries it. And you can always find it on Amazon because that's always the easiest. Well, uh, and then Stephanie and Patrick Jacobs were asking if, uh, if there are recipes included along with the history. <clears throat> there are, there are, there's I think at least one recipe each chapter and then a couple extras and some sidebars. So there's probably about, I don't know, 15 or 16 recipes in there. Well, Emily, this is fascinating. Oh, uh, Tim's got a, Tim, you're turning on. I was, I'm just enthralled by the chicken stew. I've never heard of that. And I, I'm, I'm glad you said there might be a recipe because I, I, I'm, I'm well, I want to make it, whatever it is. Yes, there is a recipe in the book for chicken stew. They they shared their recipe with me, and now I can't remember if I actually, because of course it's for 80 gallons, so I can't remember what we did, if we actually did the math and put it in there, or so you'll have to see. But um, yeah, it's in there, and they cook it um, in these huge pots, you know, over gas burners, and they you have to stir it constantly. And so they just take turns stirring it for hours. And when they stir it with these special paddles, wooden paddles that are made just for the purpose, because you can't use regular canoe paddles because they have like a film on them that melts off. And so someone has to make these wooden paddles and the guy's initials were carved in them and everything. And so when the paddle sticks straight up in the stew without leaning, that's when you know it's done. That's how they tell it's done. It's a fascinating process and like I said I was with the volunteer fire department and so all morning long we would have these emergency calls come in and half of the, the guys would jump on the trucks and leave and the other half and their, their spouses and um, would stay and stir the stew and hold the babies and it was just this <laughs> bizarre experience but it was really fun and um, yeah so chicken stew. So uh, I, I think of all the things that we're not able to do because of the coronavirus, the fact that this morning's class and worship is not followed with a potluck at church might be the greatest travesty of all, because I'm sure we're all starving right now after hearing this wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank yes, you. well, maybe we can do it. Uh, we, can, we can do the potluck at a later date. Maybe. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> I think before we, we close, uh, Judy, do um, you want to tell us about next Sunday, what to be excited about? Thank you so much, Emily. And thank you, Sarah McGow, for um, bringing us, Emily. Uh, and Sarah's going to be even more generous with the Sunday School class as our speaker next week. And just as we're missing those potluck and, and eating together uh, sort of events, I'm missing the library. And as you, many of you, or most of you probably know, Sarah 